Uh, I'm Dr. Hartman. Uh, obviously, this is Circuits 2. Um, today, we are going to be talking uh, just about the syllabus and introducing some software packages that we will use throughout the course. Um, <clears throat> so first things first, um, regarding the modality of the class, um, if you don't want to physically be here at 8 o'clock in the morning, you don't have to. Uh, I'm doing the class concurrently over Zoom as well. Um, I, I believe that uh, students who are able to physically show up to class typically tend to do a little bit better in their classes, but uh, you're an adult, so that's the decision you get to make regarding your class. I don't mind uh, either way. I'm not going to hold anything against you. Um, so if you want to attend the class virtually, there is a Zoom link uh, on our course's Moodle page. Uh, I will be recording all of the lectures and all that kind of stuff so that if you want to take the class asynchronously because you have a job, blah, 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 uh, you can do that as well. Um, <clears throat> I have a link for virtual office hours from Tuesday to Thursday, uh, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, I don't officially have any in-person office hours. That being said, immediately following this class for about 45 minutes, I have time where I'll be here before I have my next class. So we can use that as unofficial in-person office hours literally every day after this class to answer homework questions, all that kind of good stuff. Um, my Engineering 221 review materials is just linked to literally my YouTube channel where I recorded all my Circuits 1 junk. So uh, if there's something that doesn't seem familiar to you, um, I, I don't want to say that I won't stop to explain things, but I may tell you, hey, go watch this video. Let's move forward. Um, all right, so that's all the stuff that's in the introduction section of the Moodle page. If we go into the course intro stuff, here is our stuff for today. Um, so there, here's the for real syllabus. Um, if we have yet another disaster, pandemic, et cetera, I reserve the right to move the class fully online if I need to. Um, course objectives, we are gonna be expanding on what was learned in circuits one. Um, the textbook is Engineering Circuit Analysis, ninth edition by Height, Kimberly, and Durbin. Uh, it is not remotely required of you to purchase this textbook. Um, it is recommended at best. And why I say recommended at best is if you go to Google and you do a search for CAD ULABI, this first link is a free online textbook written by a professor from the University of Michigan, uh, Berkeley, and University of Utah. Um, you can get a hardback copy of the book if you want for $75, uh, but you can get the PDF version for free. Um, so why spend God knows how much money at our bookstore if you can get a different textbook that effectively gives you roughly the same material for literally free. Um, so that would be my preference just because it's cheaper. Um, there are certain things that I think the Height, Kimberly, and Durbin textbook does a little bit better, but there are also certain things that this textbook does better. There are certain parts that the Irwin and Nelms textbook that I have upstairs does better. I, cre I create my notes by using, I think, seven different circuits textbooks because I get to pick and choose kind of the best way, in my opinion, to approach everything. Um, so generally speaking, there's nothing that's going to ever physically require you to have a textbook. Um, so I'm not going to assign homework problems from a textbook or anything like that. I'm just going to give you a PDF with the homework problems. And then you can use either my uh, video lectures and or any circuit analysis textbook that you can find uh, to help you solve your homework problems and all that kind of good stuff. All right, let's circle back around to here. Um, disability disclosure. Students needing testing or classroom accommodations based on a disability are encouraged to discuss those needs with me as soon as possible. Um, for more information, contact the Department of Testing and Disability Services, and I give the phone number and their website. Um, class attendance, officially, um, 
the class adheres to the guidelines found in the university catalog. Unofficially, you're adults and you're paying for this. You can come and go as you please. Doesn't bother me at all. I'm not going to hold. Um, I'm not going to penalize you for not showing up. I think your test grades will do a good enough job of that for it. So, um, academic misconduct. Um, officially, Chapter Four of the University uh, Bulletin. So, uh, behavior-wise, there's some words here. Uh, generally speaking, if you're less of a jerk than I am, then you're good on the behavior end. Uh, and with regards to cheating, this is where I'm pretty following the, the, the letter of the, the law pretty exactly. I do not like cheaters at all. I will do any and everything I can to fail you and get you kicked out if I catch you cheating. So, um, homeworks. All right. Uh, so there will be a selection of homework problems posted on our Moodle page at the end of each lecture, and these are to be submitted electronically. So if we pop over here real quick, we can see that there is actually already a homework assignment that has been assigned. Um, the due date for this homework assignment is one week from today at 5 p.m. So generally speaking, I'm going to give you a full week to do a homework assignment, <clears throat> or actually really a week and several hours because it's due at close of business. Um, <clears throat> that affords you plenty of opportunity to ask questions and all that kind of good stuff. Um, because I give you a week to do them, I have a pretty severe late penalty because you have, in my opinion, plenty of time uh, to do it, ask questions and all that kind of good stuff. My, <clears throat> excuse me, goodness. Uh, my preference is that um, all of the homeworks will be submitted electronically because it's way harder for me to accidentally lose them if you upload them. Uh, to Moodle, but for those of you that are attending the class physically, I will actually take um, physical homework assignments. Uh, I am a real jerk with regards to homework formatting. Um, so to that end, I have created a homework formatting example, and we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about exactly what it is that I want from your homework assignments. Uh, this is going to take a minute to load because I believe it's 31 pages long. So this is an old homework um, set. Um, and so I wanna go over this stuff. And yes, I realize I managed to misspell the word answer in answer guide up there, that's okay. Um, so the first thing uh, when you submit your homework, the first few pages should be the assignment sheet itself. So that's gonna serve as a cover sheet. Um, so you put your name, your CDID, and then you put all of those pages first. And the reason why I do this is because I have the assignment sheets formatted in such a way that I can write your scores for each problem and easily keep track of everything in that way. So the first couple of pages is the assignment sheet. Problem two, <clears throat> excuse me, three, four, five, six. Uh, I'm not gonna give more than five problems per assignment. It's usually gonna be somewhere closer to two or three. Um, so after the cover pages or the assignment sheet, then comes your handwritten work for problem one. There are, um, so this is in proper engineering format where I personally wrote out the problem statement and all that kind of stuff. Again, you, um, I, I do want it in proper engineering format, but it will not hurt my feelings if you literally copy the text and all that kind of stuff from the, the PDF to save yourself 30 minutes of writing all this crap down or whatever. Uh, then I get into my solution. Um, I was ludicrously meticulous in my solution, so I state explicitly using nodal analysis and redraw the circuit and then using this, that, and the other. You don't have to go into that great of detail. This is more of just uh, trying to show you a very good example of what, in my opinion, a perfect homework would look like because I did it. Um, Answers are boxed and all that kind of stuff. Not 100% required by any stretch of the imagination, but it will definitely help me. Um, blah, 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 more work, more work, more work, more work. All right, then immediately following the handwritten work for problem one is computer-aided work for problem one. Uh, so in this class, um, the expectation is, is that like if you have to solve a system of equations that's greater than a three by three 
uh, matrix. You can't do those on your peasant calculators that we ask you to take your tests with. Uh, and so you'll use some sort of computer algebra tool. My preference is that you would use MathCAD. Doesn't matter to me whether you use um, 15 or prime 4.0, 5.0 or 6.0. Um, I guess technically, I don't mind if you use um, Wolfram Alpha or something like that either, uh, but MathCAD is available to you as a Louisiana Tech student. And I have a form uh, in the, the Moodle page that will allow you to get the information and download it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so my preference would be for you to use uh, MathCAD. Anyway, anytime you use a computer assisted tool like uh, MathCAD or something like that, I would prefer that you take a screenshot of that and show me that work as well. Because it's just showing me that you know how to, to do things and all that kind of stuff. So if you don't need to use a computer to do the problem, I don't expect to see any computer work. But if you do need to use the computer, I expect to see work. I think it's fairly simple. Sorry. Um, then after that is problem two. The handwritten work. And then the computer assisted work and so forth. So that's the general format. The cover sheet, your work from problem, your handwritten work for problem one, the computer assisted work for problem one. The handwritten work for problem two, the computer assisted work for problem two, et cetera, et cetera. Seem fairly straightforward. Okay, I don't know why it confuses people consistently every quarter. I feel like it's very straightforward and I give you an example, but for whatever reason, several people managed to screw it up. Um, so if you have any questions regarding the homework formatting, do not hesitate to ask. Yes. Can you just explain how to do that? Absolutely. You are not required to use uh, engineering paper um, at all. Um, you can use plain white copy paper. I have no problem with that. Um, if, you, if your reason for not wanting to use engineering paper is because the bookstore charges an obscene amount for it, um, I buy it by the case from Amazon. Um, so you can buy a pad for me, I think 200 sheets for like six bucks, which is probably less than half of what you can get it for uh, at the bookstore. Uh, I will happily give it to you at cost just because I think our bookstore is terrible. So it's another reason why I don't like using textbooks from there. I charge too damn much money. Um, any other questions regarding homework stuff? All right. So let's circle back around to the syllabus, which is here. Okay, um, so let's see. Homework assignments are due at 5 p.m. one week after they assign, must be properly formatted, as I've shown you. Uh, any homework assignment submission that does not adhere to the format will be rejected. So what I mean by that is I will send it back to you and say, fix it. And while you're fixing it, you're incurring uh, assumedly late penalties and, and stuff like that. So I'm not saying if you turn it in improperly, I'm gonna give you a zero. I'm saying you need to fix it and the time it takes you to fix it will be reflected in your grade. Uh, yeah, so told you I was a jerk about it, being very upfront about things. So just, all right. Um, there will be a couple of design projects in this course. Um, they will require you to solve on paper um, some portions and then successfully simulate a circuit uh, to meet the needs. Uh, circuit simulations will be carried out using a program called LT Spice. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit um, today and we'll use that throughout the class. Um, LT Spice is a free circuit simulation tool. It is very powerful. It is uh, a means by which you can check the overwhelming majority of your homework. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you can see whether or not your answer is correct, whether if you uh, simulated things correctly, but it doesn't show you any of the steps that it uses. So um, it's why we don't show it to you in circuits one, because then you could do all of the web work problems effectively and just get the answer and throw it straight in. <clears throat> all right, um, for the exams, uh, there will be three exams given during this class. Each exam will consist of a closed book and notes portion to be completed in class. Um, and so typically speaking, um, I will allow an equation sheet for the exams. And 
um, for the first exam, I will provide you with a sheet of equations for part of the material. Um, and then I'll expect you to write your own for the other stuff. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For the second and third exams, it's just all your equations, whatever you feel is appropriate. Um, the in-class portion of the exams will be worth 80% of your grade. Um, and I am toying with the idea of making them multiple choice just so it's less of a pain in the butt for me to grade. But considering that there's only seven of you guys, it wouldn't really be that big of a deal for me to hand grade. Uh, that many. So I'm considering it, but I haven't made up my mind there. Uh, in addition to the in-class portion of the test, there will be a take-home portion for every test that will be somewhere between two and four problems. Uh, so the take-home portion of the test will be harder problems that you literally can't solve with your calculator or would require more uh, time and effort to be able to solve than the hour and 15 minutes I give you for the in-class portion. Uh, you'll have a week to do those. Honestly, it shouldn't take you more than 30 to 40 minutes per problem. Um, I just want to make sure that you have plenty of time because I understand that you have uh, things other than this class to worry about. So I, I try to give you as much time as you need within a reasonable uh, period to be able to take care of these. Um, the third, in, uh, excuse me, take home portion of the test, you won't have a week for because the quarter will actually end before um, the week comes up. So I make that one a little bit shorter to accommodate that. Um, your total test grade is then um, the sum of your in-class portion and your take-home portion. Um, all right, any questions regarding um, the exam format or anything like that? So on certain days, you'll take the test here, and then on other days, or uh, I can, if, if I go the uh, multiple choice format route, I may be able to just upload the test on Moodle or something like that. And you can do it from home if you wanted to. Um, if, if you if we are gonna do that at all, I'm gonna be using the Respondus Lockdown Browser, um, which will require the use of a webcam so that it can watch you take your test and make sure you're not looking at, well, I was gonna say not looking at notes and stuff, but you're allowed an equation sheet. So I don't know, I'll, I'll figure it out. Or maybe we'll just do it on Zoom and you have to have your camera on or something like that so that I can see you not actively cheating. I don't know. We'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll work out those logistics a little bit later. All right, um, grading. Uh, the weight of grades in this class is as follows. Uh, your homework is 30%, design projects are 10%, and then each exam is worth 20% uh, each for a total of 100%. Uh, my grading scale is a very strict 10 point scale, meaning an 89.99 is still a B. If you wanna make an A in my class, you've gotta pull that 90 or higher. I don't round, don't believe in it. All right, um, the contents of the syllabus are not expected to change, but if I need to, I can do it and I will let you know. I don't know. All right, I think that's going to do better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, emergency notification system stuff, COVID-19 stuff. This is all boilerplate. It should be on every syllabus you've seen at Louisiana Tech, so I'm not going to really bother going over it because you can read, I would assume. Um, all right, tentative course schedule. Um, so today, syllabus and remarks, MathCAD, intro to circuit simulation. Then we're going to get into actual... Uh, lecture stuff on Monday. So I have organized the class into what is effectively five modules, uh, let's say. So the first uh, two modules, op amps and transient analysis, will be the material that is covered on exam one, uh, which is tentatively scheduled for Tuesday, uh, June 29th. Uh, immediately after that, we will get into steady state sinusoidal analysis. There will be seven lectures on that. Um, that is largely, I would say, 65% or more of that is a review of the last third of what you were supposed to cover in uh, circuits one. And the reason why, in my opinion, I have to, I don't want to say waste, but spend so much time reviewing this stuff uh, is because for a lot of the electrical engineering students, once they 
typically make their A and B on exam one and two in circuits one, they say, well, I'm not gonna fail this class, so I'm just gonna stop paying attention. Uh, unfortunately, that crap is really important, so I have to cover it again here because I can't trust you guys to not screw around at the end of circuits one. Uh, so uh, there is gonna, there are gonna be some new topics uh, introduced, um, but a large part of it uh, is review. Uh, exam two is effectively only over that steady state sinusoidal material. <clears throat> Uh, the fourth and fifth modules, filters, that is just a very brief introduction into filters. We're only going to do uh, first and second order filters, which are just RL, RC, and RLC circuits from a different perspective. Uh, then we get into uh, three-phase circuits where we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time. Um, I'm showing that there are 26 lectures in this class. I would anticipate there being at least 20 homeworks, but again, typically between two and five questions, more in the three or four range um, for, for most of them. Um, so um, if you'll notice for the list of the exams, I have the exams already mapped out and all that kind of good stuff. And when the take home portions are due, um, so for the first test, I give you um, until midnight, second test is until midnight, and then the third test, um, you only have until, so the test is given on a, a Tuesday, you'll only have till that Friday at 5 p.m. because that is technically the close of the quarter. Um, I will likely assign the take home portion of exam three on that Monday so that you have a little bit more time to work on it. Uh, just, I, I don't think you'll need five full days to do it by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm just trying to be as accommodating as possible. Um, so does anybody have any questions or anything regarding uh, the syllabus or any other jazz? All right, so, Let's take a look then. Uh, let me close this and this and this and this. Um, so before I said uh, that MathCAD was my preference, so I have put a link here that will allow you to pop on to the project-based learning website and ask them um, to get you access to MathCAD and all that kind of good stuff. You just fill it out and uh, Miss Ashley Osborne will get to you uh, as soon as she can. My best guess would be probably later on today if you don't currently have MathCAD. Uh, she'll be able to send you the information to download it and get it registered and all that kind of jazz. So this is here on our course Moodle page. Um, then I have uh, some LT Spice material. So this is the download link. It is, uh, let's see, it used to be Linear Technologies, which is why it's LT Spice, but I think now it's done by Diligent. Let me just open and see where this directs us. Analog devices. Okay. Um, so here's where you can download it for Windows 7, 8, and 10, or download it for Mac and all that kind of good stuff. Again, the link is on the course Moodle page. Uh, I have a couple of different things here. Um, here's an overview of some of the different functionalities and all that kind of stuff. I don't know why it linked to the middle of this page. And then in addition to that material, I also have some Simon and Bramble tutorials as well, I believe. Yeah, Simon Bramble. Um, so I want to talk for a moment about LT Spice, um, and particularly what I expect of you guys. So your ability to use LT Spice is being measured as part of a lifelong learning um, ABET requirement. And so what that means is that the expectation is that you will teach yourself how to use the circuit simulation package. I am not saying that I will not answer questions. That is not remotely true. I'm happy to answer questions about it. 
but I'm not going to hold your hand through everything and spend a whole lot of time teaching you how to set up and simulate every circuit or anything like that. Like I'm gonna spend some part of today, actually, we're gonna be going over a couple of things in LT Spice uh, just to kind of get you familiar with stuff. Um, so my expectation for any of the stuff where I specifically require you to use LT Spice is if you come to me with a question, I want to see that you've attempted something first. That's generally speaking how I want anything. You, if you come to me with a question about a homework problem and you say, I don't know where to start, uh, that's a great way to piss me off uh, because that to me means that you're not remotely trying. Um, I have example problems worked out. I have a wealth of resources um, that I provide to you. So for you to say, I don't know where to start generally means you aren't paying attention. At least that's how I interpret it. So I'm just letting you know how I feel about those kind of sentiments. So if you have a question about a homework problem, be, be specific about what it is that you don't understand, not just, I don't know what the hell's going on. So. All right, um, so let's look at homework problem or homework set number one real quick. So this first problem here is a Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuit problem. I don't expect you guys 100% to maybe know how to do this right off the top of your head or anything like that, but at least I certainly hope that you've been exposed to the topic of Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits, right? Okay. Um, if you need to review any of that kind of stuff, let me know and we can spend a little bit of time today doing it. If not, we'll kind of move along. Uh, one thing that I wanna point out here uh, for part C, when you're asked to determine the Thevenin resistance RTH seen between the terminals, that means that uh, I want a direct calculation. So don't say that if I know the answer to part A and I know the answer to part B, then R Thevenin is simply V Thevenin divided by I Norton. I want you to give me the dead network and then do the resistor combination analysis. As it turns out, you will need to employ a delta Y conversion to determine the Thevenin resistance. Have any of you guys heard of a delta Y conversion? All right, uh, so a delta Y conversion is a way to convert a delta resistor bank into a Y connected resistor bank. Um, I can't draw on this right here. So let me open this thing up. Can you guys all see the engineering paper? I mean, I know that you can, but the people on Zoom. No, so I don't see any engineering paper. All right, let me stop sharing that. Try this again. What about now? Yes. Okay. So I'm not gonna go over the rules for a Delta Y conversion, um, mainly because I don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, they're widely available in all circuits textbooks and even Wikipedia does a pretty good job of it. Uh, but effectively, if I have a resistor network, I'm just gonna call this guy terminal A. And I have some impedance. I'm gonna call this ZA. Could be a resistor, could be something else. Call this terminal B. Call this guy down here terminal C. There is a means by which I can make it look like this. So it's just a direct reconfiguration between those three terminals, right? So if I can label a terminal A, B, and C in one network, I can replace the resistors between that with this Y combination, and I can go in the opposite direction as well. 
So this way from the delta to the y is obviously a delta y transformation and the other way around is a y delta transformation. Now, I could redraw these two things in a way that's probably gonna look a little bit more like what your circuit will look like when you redraw things. So here's terminal A. Let me put my impedance ZA here. Here's terminal B. Here's C. This is C and this is C. So this is more of the, the window pane style of what at least I'm used to giving in circuits one and stuff like that. This is still a delta connected network. There's a resistor between terminal pairs A and B, a resistor between terminal pairs uh, B and C, and a resistance between terminal pairs C and A. Um, and that can be converted to what looks like a T connected network. So here's terminal A, this is Z1. So, so this second batch here, which is still the delta Y conversion that we were talking about, is probably more in line with what you're gonna actually wind up doing throughout this class, at least from a, what it looks like when it's presented to you uh, perspective. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you guys for this particular homework assignment to spend the five minutes it takes to Google it and then familiarize yourself with it. Um, I used to make my circuits to students derive it, um, but that's just, I don't know, 90 minutes worth of terrible algebra for no real value. So uh, we're going to use it um, a little bit here at the beginning of the class. Once we get into three phase circuit analysis, uh, delta Y transformation becomes very, very uh, integral to simplifying our circuits. So I'm just trying to get you familiarized with the concept now before we use it constantly later on. So. Uh, Feel free to look it up and, and get used to it and all that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, can you guys see the homework one assignment sheet now on uh, Zoom? No, we still see it. Um, the engineering paper. I don't know why it's being difficult. It's hard. It was there. I'm sharing the screen, so it should just be whatever's on the screen. Oh, well. okay. So problem one is a Thevenin and Orton equivalent circuit problem. Uh, the only real trick to anything there is the fact that you're gonna have to use a delta Y transformation uh, in part C. Everything else is fairly straightforward. Uh, the second problem here is another Thevenin and Orton equivalent circuit problem. Um, uh, but there is a dependent source involved. Um, so you'll have to use, you know, the, adjust your approach uh, due to the presence of the dependent source, uh, which means effectively that you cannot, I don't wanna say you can't measure the resistance directly because you can, uh, but to do that re would require the use of a test source. So my expectation on this one um, is that you will, you know, determine VTHAVN and determine I Norton and then for part C, take the ratio. So effectively just problem one repeated, but a little bit different. And then here we'll have problem three, which is another Thevenin and Norton problem. Uh, but in this case, there are no independent sources whatsoever. So I ask you to use the test source method to solve for the resistance. And I want you to use both a test voltage source and a test current source. You should get the same answer regardless of whether you use the voltage source, positive polarity up or positive polarity down, 
or the test current source reference direction up or reference direction down. Any way you slice it, you should get the exact same answer. I just want you to get in the habit of using test sources and stuff like that because we're going to be doing that quite a bit. Um, so anybody have any questions with regards to Thevenin and Norton? It's something that we're going to be using as a circuit analysis tool a whole heck of a lot here in circuits too. All right, the next couple of problems are dealing with transient analysis. Uh, so the first problem here is a complex, um, and, and I mean that with regards to its difficulty, not the fact that it has complex numbers in it in, by any means, um, problem involving um, RL circuits, okay? Um, so it's fairly unlikely that you've seen anything like this before. Um, so I typically get asked a couple of questions about this. Now we can notice that there are two inductors in this circuit, right? Uh, and the inductors cannot be combined into a single inductance because they're not in series and they're not in parallel. Uh, so the question that I get asked a lot is how would I approach a problem like this? So because we're looking at this problem as a natural response problem, uh, and by that I mean when the switch gets closed at T is equal to zero, that five amp source is getting effectively disconnected from both of those inductors, what's happening is that we have two discrete RL circuits, right? So none of the current that's flowing through in uh, the 2.5 Henry inductor will influence the behavior of the four Henry inductor and vice versa because everything's gonna wind up flowing through that short circuit, right? So the two inductors don't influence each other in any way, shape or form. So really this is just two single RL circuits buried inside this one larger circuit. So treat it that way and this is fairly trivial, right? Um, the time constants, you're going to have two different time constants because there are two RL circuits, um, but there's only one R associated with each L. So again, this is going to be real trivial. And then part uh, E wants you to find the current flowing through the switch, um, which is going to be the sum of the inductor currents and that DC contribution as well. So it should be five amps plus something e to the t over tau one plus something e to the t over tau two. So nothing, nothing uh, particularly difficult, just making you guys think a little bit. And then part B, we have another transient analysis problem. Uh, it looks like I'm just focusing on RL circuits here for whatever reason. Uh, this guy has a dependent source, which technically makes things a little bit harder, but really the analysis steps don't particularly change. You just have to pay attention to the fact that there's a dependent source in here. So any of these homework problems for homework set one, which is just making sure you can do what you need to do, anything seem absurdly difficult. All right. By all means, if you run into something when you're working them, ask questions and all that kind of stuff. I got no problem helping you uh, by any means, but I feel like if you, you pass circuits one, you should be able to do all of these without too much difficulty. So let's circle back around to our first problem here, and I'm going to open up LT Spice. If I can find it in this hot garbage of stuff I have on my desktop. Find my house real quick. So I'm fully aware that probably none of you currently have this program installed. Uh, that's perfectly okay. Was I smart enough to save the circuit? Dropbox 223. Not actually. Do I have a folder that says LT Spice somewhere? Of course I don't. Okay, so I didn't save it. All right, not a problem. Um, 
Let me ask again, can the people on Zoom see LT Spice? <laughs> My best guess is for whatever reason you can't, but I just want to make sure. Is it a gray screen? Yes, yes it is. It's a blank gray screen, yeah. right? See it. Okay, cool. Yes, um, so what I'm going to do real quick here is I'm going to build out the homework or uh, the, the circuit from homework problem one, uh, which means I'm gonna have to look at it real quick. Should have printed it out. All right, so let's start by throwing some resistors in here. All right, so um, if you can see my mouse up here at the top of the screen, this is where generic components are, are located and all this kind of stuff. So the one that looks like a pen is how we draw wires. Uh, this down arrow is ground. This is how uh, this signpost thing is how we annotate things and I'll use that uh, a lot. Uh, then we have resistors, capacitors, inductors, diodes, and then this guy that looks like a digital logic key is the general components menu. Um, so we can put in anything here. Um, so there are some special things like there's opt amps, opto electronics, um, analogs and digital converters, comparators, all kinds of crazy stuff, and then we just have simple uh, components. So before we get into anything specific here, I want to talk about this guy right here, BI. This is an arbitrary behavioral current source. Um, so that's fancy talk for dependent current source. Okay. Um, and so there isn't one in this circuit, but I'm just going to drop it in real quick so I can show you something. Let me get my keyboard so it's going to make sense. So we can see that the current source gives us a reference direction of down. Um, and then this thing here that says I is equal to F dot dot dot. What that means is if I right click on this thing, I can change the expression for I, which is the current flowing through this device and tell it to be whatever I want it to be. So this is why it's a dependent current source. I get to put in just some sort of mathematical relationship, okay? Um, coming back up here, we also have BV, which is a behavioral voltage source. This is a dependent voltage source. And we can do the exact same thing. It's going to have V is equal to F dot dot dot, where I just get to type in a function. Uh, then we have all kinds of stuff like um, diodes and transistors and this, that, and the other. None of that stuff's really going to concern us too much. Um, current is an independent current source. We are gonna have one of those in our circuit, so we'll get to that in a second. And then voltage is an independent voltage source. Um, it doesn't matter whether those are uh, DC sources, AC sources, exponential sources, pulse width modulated sources, they're all here and we can play with our parameters uh, to make it work. So uh, with that being said, let's uh, start drawing things here. All right, so I got a resistor. I can rotate it by pressing Control R. And there's another resistor over here. Then there was a resistor over here. And I think one over here. And I'm gonna start wiring some of this stuff up before I forget about what I'm doing. I know that there are more resistors in this. I just can't remember everything. So I'm just using that kind of pencil tool to draw in wires. All right, need to circle back around. Okay, so um, I put one of my resistors where the five amp source is going to be. Does it matter at all if I put my five amp source? Well, it's got a reference direction down. I'm going to rotate it twice to make it go up. Uh, so my question that I'm asking you guys is, 
does it matter if I put the current source on the left and the resistor on the right as it's drawn, or if I do it the opposite way around where the resistor is on the left and the current source is on the right? Does that change literally anything? No, okay, so I'm gonna leave it instead of just erasing stuff and making it look perfect. Trying to wire all this junk up. I'm going to shrink it and move it just so I can see stuff. Uh, okay, so I'm missing a voltage source over here. So what I'm going to do, delete that guy, delete that guy. So it was resistor here. Voltage. If I was smart, I would have printed things out before class. On the right hand side, I just have a resistor. So if I put a wire there, I can just drop a resistor on top and it'll replace that section of wire like so. Um, then I have a resistor and a voltage source. All right, so this is what our circuit generally looks like. Now I need to go through and put in component values. Um, so let's see, 10, 10. So all of the resistors except the two stacked on top of each other are 10. So this guy's a 20. So to put my component value in, all I did was right click with my mouse over the resistor schematic symbol. Um, so I wanna point out a couple of things here. Uh, this is gonna be a 20 ohm resistor. So I just lead, literally need to write to zero. Uh, I do not need to include units because the units are already in there. Um, if I wanted a kilo ohm resistor, I would put 20K. If I want a mega ohm resistor, I put 20 MEG. Uh, the reason why I can't do 20M is because it would interpret that as uh, doesn't matter if I use a uppercase M or a lowercase M, it treats it as milla. So MEG is mega or 10 to the six. Um, so anyway. Uh, I can also put tolerances in. So for instance, um, most of you guys learned in your uh, lower level engineering classes that resistors have tolerance values uh, can be as high as 20% or as low as 1%. So I can put something there so it will make the resistor not be exactly 20 ohms or whatever. Uh, and I can also put a specific power rating. Uh, so what, what I can do is I can create a resistor that behaves very much like a real resistor and then use LG Spice to see whether or not I'm going to exceed the power handling capabilities of the resistors in my network and all that kind of good stuff. So this is a good way to prototype things without potentially burning stuff up as well, uh, which probably what it's more used for than screwing around in class, but anyway. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and change the values of all of the resistors appropriately. All right, let's look real quick at our voltage sources. So we have a 30 in the bottom left and a 20 in the top right. Um, so notice here, all of the voltage sources in LT Spice are treated as a practical voltage source, meaning we get to specify a DC value of a, volt, a voltage as well as the internal resistance of the voltage source, okay? Um, if I click this advanced button here, here's where I can get pulses, sinusoids, exponential functions. I don't remember what SFFM stands for. And then PWL um, is I'm just connecting lines together or I could import a file that looks like a specific 
um, voltage waveform. Um, so here's all the time varying voltage sources that I have available. Over on the right hand side here, um, this is just a shorthand way to put in the DC value. Um, this small signal AC analysis, this is what we're going to use when we're talking about filters and all this kind of stuff. And then parasitic properties, we could do this when we were creating voltage sources and stuff for integrated transistor circuits, which is beyond the scope of this class. Um, so this is actually very, very powerful because we have a DC circuit. We just want to put in a simple DC value. So if I'm not mistaken, it's 30 over here in the bottom left, 20 here in the top right. Yeah. And then for my current source, it is five amps. Um, notice that it doesn't let me directly specify the parallel internal resistance of the current source. Um, so I would have to do that in manually. And if I click the advanced tab, I have all of the same options I had for voltage sources. All right. So if I try to simulate this circuit, and let me just go ahead and do that. Um, so if I click this little icon that looks like a man that's running, that is run simulation. Uh, because this is a DC circuit, I want to do a DC operating point uh, analysis. So it gives me an error that the circuit does not have a conduction path to ground. Please flag a node as ground. So that was absolutely expected. LT Spice does everything using nodal analysis. So I have to specify a reference node, okay? So let's look back at our original circuit here. Our goal of the first problem is to determine the Thevenin voltage seen between terminals A and B of the circuit above by calculating the open circuit voltage of the live network with a positive polarity voltage reference on the left. So if I wanted to use LT Spice to determine where, or to, to determine what my feminine voltage was, where should I put my ground here? So I think let's, directly at the bottom middle. Okay, so we could put it at the bottom and let's do just that, all right? There we go. All right. So that is that. I'm going to do something here real quick. I'm going to use this um, flagpole thing that says label net, although you guys can't see it because the zoom thing is in the way. There it goes. If I mouse over it, why is it not showing me the thing now? Okay, whatever. Um, and I can put in flags here. So I'm going to put VA. And I'm going to attach it to this node point right here, uh, because this would be the same as where I have terminal A located. And I'm going to do something similar, and I'm going to do VB. And I'm going to attach that guy over here. Now, the reason why I am doing this, if I mouse over this middle region right here, LT Spice, because it does everything in nodal analysis, it automatically assigns nodes to things but it doesn't really tell you what they are in any direct way. You have to mouse over it. So you can see very at the very bottom left of the screen in little bitty letters, it says this is node N001. Um, it assigns nodes from top to bottom and left to right. So this is node one, this would be node two, this was node three, but now I've specified it to be node A then this would have been node four, et cetera. So anytime we want a particular node of interest to not have to go through and figure out what the hell node it is, we can just label it and then it uses that instead. So that is, I believe, a handy tool. So let's run this DC operating point simulation. And we get a list of the following pieces of information. We're told the voltage at node one, we're told the voltage at node A, so that's what that VVA thing is. And then we have the, uh, the voltage at node B. Um, so our Thevenin voltage would be what? Uh, 
So let's look at the problem again. We're asked to determine the feminine voltage seen between the terminals A and B of the circuit above by calculating the open circuit voltage of the live network with a positive polarity voltage reference on the left. So the positive polarity voltage terminal is associated with node A in this uh, drawing. And the negative polarity voltage for our thevenin voltage is associated with node B. So what is the thevenin voltage? It's VA minus VB, right? Would it be 20? Yeah, it'll be 20. So the suggestion that you had was to place our ground at this bottom middle area. I, because I'm lazy and I don't want to do any math that I don't have to, would have instead, if I'm using this to check my answer, connect the negative terminal of my thevenin voltage to ground directly so that if I run this simulation, now the voltage at node A is my thevenin voltage. So that's my lazy way of doing things. This is the beauty of LT Spice. You don't have to set up the, the ground where you, like if I were, if I were analyzing this circuit, um, on paper, I would have 100% put my ground exactly where you originally suggested. Because I'm analyzing this circuit using a computer tool, I'm gonna put it in the place that makes me get the answer the fastest, which is putting my, refer uh, putting my reference node at the negative polarity terminal, right? Um, so uh, another thing that I wanna point out here, when we mouse over any of the individual components in our circuit simulation tool, uh, it tells us a few things about it, okay? So when we mouse over this component, it tells us um, the DC current that's flowing through it and how much power uh, is dissipated by it. Unfortunately, it does not tell us in any way, shape, or form the direction of the current flowing through things, but we can actually fix that. So I'm gonna delete this DC operating point thing here, and I am going to instead put in a transient analysis. And because this is a DC circuit, it really doesn't matter what time I associate it with. So I'm just gonna do it for one second and I'm gonna run my simulation. And now I get this empty plot up here, which I'm gonna minimize because I'm not entirely sure that I'm even gonna use right now. Now, when I mouse over the circuit elements, when I'm over the circuit element specifically, I get a current probe, okay? Where the arrow of the current probe tells me the direction that it's saying the current is flowing. So from right to left, I have a current of 1.125 amps flowing through this particular resistor. And as I mouse over the different resistors, again, I can see the different current values and their directions. When I mouse over a node, this is telling me what the voltage is at this particular node with respect to ground. So the DC operating point simulation is all fine and dandy, but to me, it doesn't really give us quite enough information because it doesn't include uh, directions for currents, which can be confusing, particularly if you're trying to set up a, uh, in, excuse me, a dependent voltage or current source correctly, because you need to know the directions of things to make stuff work right. So I just wanted to point that out to you guys. Um, all right, so finding the Thevenin equivalent voltage, fairly trivial, right? What if we wanted to do the Norton current? I'm gonna leave, well, I said I was gonna leave. I'm gonna put my ground back where it was originally, uh, just because I don't want it to get into the way. All right, get or get in the way. And I am going to short circuit terminal A, which is over here, to terminal B, because that's how I find the equivalent. If I run, I run into an issue here, okay? And the issue is, is that in LT Spice, wires are considered nodes, okay? 
if I want the current that flows through something, it has to be the current flowing through an element. So whenever I mouse over a particular circuit element, that's when I get a current probe. So what I should do here, there are a couple of different things I could do. One way I could rectify this is to just put a resistor somewhere in this path and just make its resistance value really, really small, okay? Um, if I make it small enough, so on the order of micro ohms or something like that, in the grand scheme of things, it's not gonna change too terribly much. Um, so that would work. Uh, another thing, it might be a little bit better to do technically, is I'm gonna put a voltage source here. I'm gonna rotate it like so. Um, right click it and give it a DC value of zero because it's a short circuit. Now, when I run my simulation, there is a circuit element there that I can measure the current. And so I can see that my current is negative two amps flowing from right to left. Um, so if we went to our, um, let's see, problem statement here, we want the Norton current with a current reference direction to the right. So by inspection here, my Norton current is then positive two amps because it's the current flowing in the opposite direction. So this is how I can use LT spice to verify voltages and currents in DC circuits. I can also use it to verify voltages and currents in um, RL circuits and stuff like that. So um, I got 10 minutes left. So let me delete this guy. No. I'm gonna draw a very, very simple RL circuit. And I'm gonna to choose to put my ground down here, all right? Um, let's do five ohms and one Henry. And let's say that the inductor had an initial current, so at T is equal to zero minus, our inductor has a current of 10 amps. Uh, in order to put initial conditions in on my circuit, on my energy storage elements like capacitors and inductors, I have to write SPICE code. So I click this thing up here where it says dot OP and it lets me type in SPICE directives. Um, so to do an initial condition on a capacitor or an inductor, I literally do dot IC for initial condition. The current through my inductor, which is labeled as L1, just to make sure here, is equal to 10, so 10 amps, that's it. All right, and I'm going to, let's see. I'm gonna do a transient analysis. Uh, what's my time constant for this guy gonna be? It's an RL circuit. Is it R times L, R over L, or L over R? L over R is the time constant. Okay, so L over R, so that's gonna be 0.2. So I have a time constant of 0.2 seconds. So I'm gonna look at this guy for 1.5 seconds because that'll be enough time for it to fall all the way down, supposedly. Um, so just for the sake of argument, let's just look at the current here. So we see that it decays exponentially from 10 amps to zero amps and it takes some amount of time, okay? So if I give you a problem, uh, a transient analysis problem, you can simulate the circuit. So typically speaking, I would simulate the circuit for T is equal to zero plus and greater um, because using switches in LT spice can get a little bit annoying uh, having them 
timed correctly and all that kind of stuff. So I just typically split it up as I can analyze it as a DC circuit at T is equal to zero minus, and then as a transient analysis circuit for T is greater than zero plus. So this is how the circuit is behaving at T greater than zero plus with this particular initial condition, okay? If I right click on here and add trace, I uh, hear where it says expressions to add, I can literally put in a mathematical expression to check my analytical answer that you solve for. For th this is such a simple circuit, we know that it's gonna be I at zero plus, which is 10, multiplied by the exponential of negative T, right? So negative time, because that's the variable that it chooses to use for T divided by our time constant, which we found to be 0 0.2. Let me move this out of the way. So on the left-hand side, we have a scale that ranges from 10 amps to zero amps. And on the right-hand side, we have a scale that ranges from 10 to zero because I didn't include any units in my analytical expression. Let me get these things out of the way. What does it mean that the green curve that we had previously effectively disappeared here? The blue curve is 100% superimposed on top of it, meaning that our analytical solution to the problem exactly matches that of the simulation. This is how we check our answers for transient analysis problems. Okay, it's, it's that simple. So if I, let's say I screwed this up and I said instead of um, I got my time constant wrong and instead of doing L over R, I did R times L. That would be the same as just multiplying by that instead of dividing it. I would see that my answers do not match. This gives me an indication that I have made a mistake in my analytical solution because I do not match the simulation. Okay, so there is, uh, I'm giving you guys access to, by, by teaching you how to use LT Spice, a means by which to check 95% of your homework problems. Um, so this is a good way to see whether or not you've made a mistake somewhere. Now, I will tell you, LT Spice can be rather finicky. Uh, and so what I mean by that, and I don't know for sure if this is gonna break it, so I'm just gonna see what happens. Oh, that's not, oh, sorry. What I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to change my ground. So before I had that little stub, then connected to ground. Now I'm just gonna connect ground to this thing. I don't know why, and it may not do it in this case, but sometimes if you don't put the little stub of wire to connect to ground, it just messes up the simulation and you can have the exactly correct answer and LT Spice will simulate it incorrectly. So let's just see for the sake of argument if it happens to do it now. Now for this particular simple circuit, it did do it. But I would say always just put that little stub of wire to connect to ground just to be safe because for, for whatever reason, sometimes LT Spice will just say, I don't like how that looks and it'll just skew the answers a little bit. Another thing that you want to pay attention to is that the scales on the left hand side and the right hand side are the same. So for instance, if I right click over here and I make this go from 12 down to zero, they no longer look like they match, even though I know that the answer is correct. And it's because the scales are off, right? So the scale on the left-hand side needs to exactly match the scale on the right-hand side and able to, uh, in order to do a one-to-one -one comparison between the two waveforms. If the scales are off, who knows whether you're, the, the, uh, the, the waveforms match or not because you're not comparing them correctly. So just something to, to be aware of because sometimes LT Spice, when you put in a mathematical expression, will choose to use a different scale than the simulation does. Just trying to make you aware of things where you can swear up and down you're doing it correct, and it turns out you are. You just didn't notice that 
this side goes from zero to 12 when the other side goes from zero to 10, which is inherently going to make them look different. So, all right. Uh, okay, I talked for more than I was expecting to today. So we're gonna knock off about five minutes early unless anybody has any other questions. Um, and I'll see you guys on uh, Monday. <laughs>